and we are about to start. Yeah. <laughs> and this water is for me, not for my cat. All right. So according to my clock, it's uh, we are on the hour now. Hello, De Deborah. 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 <laughs> and welcome, welcome. All right. Welcome to our webinar, How to Become an Animator. Uh, in this webinar, we will talk about lots of uh, lots of things. I'm really excited. Um, first of all, we're talking a little bit about the job of an animator. Um, what is it that you do as an animator? What are your expectations about wages and working conditions? Um, yeah, requirements, wages. Um, we'll talk about the phases of a career in animation and the path and method, methods that you can use to learn animation. Like, you know, should you go to animation school? There's mentoring, there's self-teaching. We will talk about the pros and cons uh, about all of these methods. Then some step-by-step -step teaching methods, like anything that you can do to further your animation skills. We'll talk about that. Uh, the costs of learning animation and the cost for software and equipment. And of course, very important for an animator's career is the portfolio and the demo reel. Um, the software, we will talk about what free software you can use to get started with animation if you don't have the budget to, um, to jump right into buying the expensive stuff. Um, at the very end, we will have a Q&A and I'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Some of you also get got an email with a survey and uh, I'm really excited about some of these questions. They really helped me to steer my presentation in the right direction. So, so thank you very much for everyone who participated in the survey. Um, yeah, first a few words about me. Uh, my name is Ferdinand Englander. I'm an animation freelancer from Germany. And I mostly do 2D animation and uh, rigging. And I can show you my show reel from, um, this is actually from two years ago. It's more like, more of a studio reel than a demo reel. Like I wouldn't send this to, to a studio. Uh, and we will talk about later on why. But yeah, here you can see a little bit of my work. It's a lot of 2D animation. Uh, I also did a little bit of 3D. Um, and one of the biggest projects that I've been working on was for a point and click adventure called The Inner World. And we recently actually made a sequel where I was animation lead, um, actually leading like five, six other animators, which was pretty exciting. Other than that, I do a lot of commercials and um, explainer videos. Yeah, there's a little bit of 3D. Um, there and for a BBC series called Patchwork Pals, I did um, layout and uh, rigging. Um, somebody in the chat says something that froze. did something freeze for you. Um, well, try restarting the browser. I hope everybody else can uh, hear and see me fine. So if if there is any problems with video or audio, just let us know in the chat um, and we'll try to address it. Now, before we start, <laughs> I am frozen on his screen. Is that happened for everybody? Anyway, um, so before we start, you should probably get something to, to write because I hope that I will be sharing interesting stuff um, um, that you might want to read down, write down. And um, also, if you have any questions, um, also, if you have any questions, write them down and ask them later in the Q&A so you don't forget them. Um, yeah, about the length of this, I don't quite know. I think it might be an hour, uh, but maybe la last time when we started and if we've been right, it took up to two hours. And of course the Q&A can go as long as you ask questions and as long as I'm not too tired. Um, all right, so let's 
talk about what does an animator actually do? And to be honest, I am the kind of guy I like taking a step back and looking, um, looking what it is that we do from a philosophical, from an artistic standpoint. Um, for the definition, I would say, an animator creates the illusion of movement through a rapid succession of single frames by manipulating material that wouldn't behave this way on its own. And that's what makes it different from film. You know, film is also just a variety of, um, just a, a succession of frames. But in, in animation, we have material that doesn't live, that doesn't move, and we make it move. And um, I think that's that's a very fascinating uh, fascinating thing to do. But then, for me, this is this is probably the most important point of the definition. We don't just do that for the sake of movement. We do it so that the audience and audience can connect and be engaged and can feel something, feel with the characters that we create. Um, and I think the job of an animator is very, um, well, I think it's very demanding and it's, it has a variety of fields that we need to master, like, uh, on the area of art and design and painting, we have, we need to have an understanding of good design, of composition, of posing, of creative thinking, um, uh, and this is already stuff, you know, a, that a painter would have to do. But we also need to learn about storytelling. Even if we're not writing a story, we need to, to, to know, you know, where is our animated performance? Where does it take place in the entire construct of the story? And how do I make it fit with the rest of the story? Um, we need to learn about film editing. You know, the, the animated shots that we do, they need to line up to something that feels good, that makes sense, that has a rhythm, that has a flow. Um, maybe we even need to learn uh, about dancing, about fight chore choreography, and, and we need to have a feeling for rhythm in general. Um, then we need to learn about physics. How do objects fall and accelerate and all these nice things? And... Um, uh, we need to know about biology and anatomy, uh, not only if you want to draw the human figure, but also if you want to animate. Like, you, you don't want to overbend the elbow to a degree that it looks broken, right? So even as a 3D animator, you need to know um, biology and uh, anatomy, how far the joints go. Um, there sure is a lot of technology that you have to master to become a good animator. Then there's acting and psychology that you need to make a good, um, authentic human performance. And uh, all of these things you could already dedicate your life to. Like there, there are certainly people who do just one of these things for their entire life. It, it's, it's fields that are so big. But if you want to be a good animator, you kind of need to know about a little bit uh, of all of them. And... Um, to see it from a little more classic standpoint, there are also some more things that you might read in a job description if they were one for animators. I think animators need a lot of discipline because uh, doing animation is a very time consuming um, profession. You know, you, you work for weeks and months to make just a couple of seconds of animation. Um, and you need willpower to to work on that. Um, then um, besides the lonely working on one shot, there's also the part of collaboration. Uh, if you've ever seen the credits of a feature film, you know that there's hundreds of people working on these. And um, yeah, if you, if, you, if you work as an animator, you need to collaborate. There are weeklies where you talk to your supervisors and your other animators. Um, and then there also is a lot of adaption. Um, like in 2D, this is the most obvious. If you have a, an art director who has a certain style, you need to adapt 
to that style. You need to draw in that style as well. But also 3D animators have to adapt. Like if it's a certain way of animating, if it's very cartoony or if it's very realistic, you know, this is a style that that you then would have to adapt to. Um, so I guess the moral of the story that I want you to get is that animation is work. It's not fun 24-7. Um, it, it is a very, very nice job to have, but at the end of the day, it's work like any other work. And there are good days and bad days and enjoyable days and not so enjoyable days. Um, but I think your work should always be fulfilling, not only animation work, but you know, you should see that you still you still get something out of this, uh, this wonderful profession. Um, so uh, working conditions, um, this for sure is also a very big topic. Uh, I was happy to hear that in 2017, storyboard and VFX artists were actually in high demand. Um, so apparently all, all the outsourcing didn't help here. The studios were still really searching for, um, for uh, talented um, VFX artists and storyboard artists uh, in the Western world. And um, um, to give you a, a rough line of what you can expect as a wage as an animator, there's a study from the Animation Guild. They do one every year. And for 2017, they found out that 3D animators uh, get a thousand dollars minimum and three thousand five hundred dollars uh, maximum around that for the 2d animators it's a bit big uh, for the 2d animators it's a bit less um, and uh, from my experience in Germany um, I had the whole range of like some weeks I would only get 400 euros some weeks I would earn 2,000 euros a week and um, but actually, because I am um, doing freelance work, it's uh, it's varying a lot. Um, um, yeah, and the problem is, of course, that sometimes you have weeks or even months as a freelancer where you're earning nothing because you're just preparing, you're trying to find projects. Um, and that's why maybe you think 2,000 euros per week uh, seems very high, but you know, it's actually that you need to consider that if you are freelance animators, there are weeks, there are months where you might make not, uh, as much money. So you need to, to save up. Um, yeah, but it's interesting to know these numbers and to know what to expect. Um, I should also mention that there are animation jobs, jobs for animators and modelers and, 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 and people that would usually work in the entertainment industry. There are jobs for these people outside of the entertainment industry. Like the car industry does a lot of 3D visualization. Basically any image of a car that you see in a magazine, that is not real, that is CG. Um, and those jobs pay really, really well. Also advertisement generally pays pretty good, at least in, in, in Germany. It's very stressful, but it pays pretty good. Um, so just keep that in mind. I know we, most of us probably want to tell the good stories like Disney and Pixar or be at Disney and Pixar, but there are more jobs. Um, all right, so let's talk about the phases of an animation career. Um, the first phase, I think it's a very interesting one. It's my favorite one. It's the play and experimentation phase. And uh, that happens, well, it's, it's just aimless animating for fun. And that usually happens often oh, while we are still in high school. Um, because we have time after school to just do whatever we want. And we learn animation by solving problems. Like we want to animate a certain thing. So we look about up in the internet how to do it. And then we just do it. Then we tell our, um, we tell our, our stories that we want to tell. And, um, this phase is amazing because you will never have as much spare time in your life. Um, well, maybe when you're retired then again, but, 
Um, and you also have complete creative freedom because you're just doing this basically for yourself. Um, and many people use this phase to be active in a community. I missed out uh, there a little bit, but you might have seen like on YouTube or on Newgrounds, a lot of animators that just do uh, uh, fan art and, and fan movies. Um, the problem with this phase is that you don't learn systematically. You don't improve because you want to improve. You just want to get your stuff done somehow. Um, so you only look up the bare minimum of what you need to, to do what you want to do. You don't sit down and learn and practice. Um, then at least I learned a lot of bad habits. Like I didn't have a, a, a clear, um, a clear workflow for the longest time. And sometimes it's a bit difficult to unlearn these things that we learn during this phase. Um, um, another disadvantage is that the projects that you do during the experimentation phase, they stay unfinished or are very unprofessional because, well, you're not on this professional level. You're not doing anything to learn that. Um, Thank you guys for the questions. We mark these so we can come back to them later. Um, if they're not like super relevant to what I'm talking about now, we'll get back to hopefully a lot of them uh, later on. Um, the second phase is when it comes to systematic learning. Um, this is when you start learning strategically and proactively because you want to get better. You want to reach the professional level. You made that decision. Um, and usually then people de dedicate half or full time to learning and practicing. And you can get help through an animation school, mentoring or discipline self-learning. Um, formal education in animation isn't a must, which I think is really interesting because for most jobs, you know, you need to have a diploma that says that you can do this job. You cannot become a doctor uh, without getting the certificate from a government that says that you are a doctor. But in animation, you can just call yourself an animator. You can say, I'm ready. I'm an animator. I'm presenting myself as an animator. Um, so the advantage, obviously, or we entered systematic skill shaping. Now we're really getting better. Um, it can feel a bit tedious and dry to dedicate to theory to practicing because you don't feel like you're doing something productive yet. Um, then uh, this is the phase where you were actively seeking input from masters and other students, which is a really good thing. You built your portfolio to get hired. Um, you create projects in a safe space. They don't need to earn money yet. You can, this is in a way, this is still experimenting, uh, experimenting. Um, many student projects are still too ambitious. Uh, this is something that carries over from the first phase and lack a little bit of focus and workflow. Um, and during this phase, you're usually looking for a job. And there are a couple of ways of how you can do that. For example, through networking. Um, and the first people that you network with are, of course, your classmates. And you should never underestimate um, this factor of networking because these people, um, they will also go places. They will go to studios and they can recommend you. And they will, maybe somebody will found their own animation student. And it's, it's very, hmm? You said studios. Uh, they'll found their own animation studio. And then it's very helpful to know these people uh, and to constantly talk about the industry and animation and the jobs and opportunities. Um, now, Another very great opportunity for networking is on festivals and conferences. Um, there actually is this website, animation-festivals.com, that lists like a whole bunch of them. You can filter them by country and see what's near you. Um, if you are in Europe, I can also recommend you going to, to other countries that are near you, uh, maybe even submitting if you have a, a short film. 
Um, but yeah, you will, you will get to know other people from the industry. You will get to know filmmakers. You will talk with producers. Um, those are, um, pretty amazing, um, amazing chances that you can have in this environment. And then this trick I think is actually quite amazing. Um, this is a tip that like opened my eyes when I got it. Um, people really like you if you are a matchmaker, if, um, and there are many cases where being a matchmaker doesn't hurt you. Like, um, I am a mostly a 2D animator, so if I hear a opportunity for a 3D animator, I recommend that to one of my friends who does 3D. In return, if they hear about a 2D opportunity, they recommend me. So, um, yeah, being being a matchmaker is something that that positions you as a very friendly, very um, helpful person, and it will actually help you many, many karma points uh, to collect many karma points and opportunities that will come back to you. Um, then another part of this job searching process, of course, is um, you present yourself, you now have material to present yourself. And uh, of course, that's your projects that you can show on festivals or just distribute them through the internet. You can build a demo reel to show your abilities. Um, and you build an artist and online persona. Um, and you can do that through the communities that you're active in or your Facebook profile or your websites. Um, you know, show a little bit about what drives you, who you are uh, and what you can do. And then people will find you and will ask you if you can work for them. Okay. Then let's assume you made it. You're in a studio now. Uh, in many cases, you would start out as a trainee or a, an intern. And this is great because now you can, you can learn and work at a professional studio. Um, and you will slowly transition or, or not so slowly transition from practice to productive work. And, uh, I tell you, productive work is a whole, a whole different thing again. Um, because now you have real life project workflows, you know, those studios, they have the way how they do things. That's from the software that they use to how they document things, uh, through like just how the processes go and the signing off and, uh, the weeklies go and stuff like that. And of course, in the real world, there are always deadlines. Um, the uh, animation schools try to simulate that a little bit, but the reality is is a whole nother thing. Um, yeah, the advantage is you have your foot in the door, you have access to professional mentors and the real tools that they're using in the studios. Um, I mean, at universities, they should also should have uh, good software, but you know, in the studio, they have the actual stuff that you need to, to work on the shots. And, um, well, one disadvantage or, or one challenge that you're still standing in front of is that you now have to work your way up. And that goes for both uh, inside and across the studio. Um, and I have to remove the kitty from my table. <laughs> there she is. She also worked her way up my desk. Um, uh, the thing about this working up thing is um, in the beginning, you might be given um, tasks that might seem a little simple to you. Like you're like, I studied animation for four years and now all I have to, to, to animate are like detailed shots or shots from really, really far away. Like I've heard some people being frustrated about that, but I mean, you have to see it from the studio's perspective. You have, well, first of all, this work has to be done too. Um, this work has to be done. Um, and second of all, you need to prove that you are worth getting these shots, getting these better shots first. So I would recommend before, before you complain, uh, that you only get boring work, do your best, uh, really do your best, impress your supervisor 
and then you might automatically get better shots or you ask after a while if you can have something more challenging. Uh, very important point. Uh, be patient, prove yourself and earn the right to work on better shots. Um, so the last phase is when you work as a professional and you reach that, that higher stand in the company, you contribute to commercial end products. If you have responsibility, maybe you're even guiding other animators. Um, uh, there are two ways of doing that. You could either be hired at a studio and be, um, um, be there under contract like for a year or two years or three years where there is the the freelancing mode where you you are basically the studio and people are giving you work and you contribute um but only for like a couple months uh, those are the two modes that animators usually work in um i also have to warn you that being under contract in animation is not as safe as it is in other jobs like, you know, there are some jobs where when you have a contract, you stay at this company forever. And this is not how the animation industry works, unfortunately. Um, but that's only logical. I mean, filmmaking is very project based. And after a film is over, a, a, a whole different phase starts for the studio and they need to fund this stuff again. And, you know, they need to plan all over again. So, yeah, no matter if you are hired for a couple of years or, um, or a freelancer, uh, you have to expect that you have to change job from time to time. And many people even use that to, um, to move from country to country. So you have a bigger selection and traveling and learning about new cultures can be, can be a very inspiring thing. Um, so if this is interesting to you, um, this is something that you can certainly do in animation or sometimes are expected to do. Um, there are two questions. Um, from Matthew, would it be better to work in a small studio working on a lot of things first or try to go for a big studio where you work on a small part of the animation? Um, let me see if I can, yeah, broadcast the comment to the room. Um, I don't think that one is necessarily better than the other. I personally, I started out in a small studio and I really enjoyed it because it feels like you can have a bigger impact on the, the whole end product. Uh, like for the inner world, it was like this, we actually during the weekly, we were also discussing the stories and riddles. So me as an animator, I could give my opinion on the work of an entirely different department and it would actually really matter and change, change the product sometimes, um, which is pretty cool. And the bigger a studio gets, the more you are in your department on your job, isolated, and you just have to do that, that job. Um, but of course, that's a whole different level of quality. Like if we speak feature film and you, you animate even just a little shot for feature film, this is something that would look extremely good in your demo reel. Um, there are pros and cons to both, I would say. Um, can, can you broadcast the question to the room? Okay, we might answer another question in a second. Um, Oh yeah, from Brando, what can you do to make yourself more hireable to an animation studio when you just got out of school? Mm. Yeah, well, <laughs> the kind of vague answer to this is make really, really impressive, good work. Like that is what matters. Um, they don't care from which school you came. Um, they only care about how good your work is. Um, I mean, it, it, more hireable. Yeah, it, it, it really comes down to the quality of, of your work, of that one or two animation shots, of that one or two really impressive animation shots that you have by that time. Um, we will talk about demo reels a little bit later. 
maybe even and yeah as soon uh how to make a good demo reel i would recommend to sticking to that but yeah make good work man that's that's the thing um all right so sometimes making a living can be a struggle i won't deny that and maybe you've heard sometimes there are studios going out of business moving to a different uh, uh, uh country by the way this is not only a problem of outsourcing this is also happening among western countries uh, for example uh, when Los Angeles st stopped doing some tax breaks and Canada offered some tax breaks, the U.S. studios, parts of them, went to um, went to Canada. And sometimes then you are in front of the choice, should I move to Canada too? Um, if you are a freelance animator and you jump from project to project, uh, sometimes this uncertainty can be a bit annoying. Um, but from my experience, as a freelancer, if you're good, you will reach that point where you have more than enough offers and you can pick a little bit that feels a little better. Uh, this will happen after a year or two. Um, all right. Yeah, the reality of working is sometimes that you have to do work that you don't, uh, don't like as much. Uh, as we said, you know, there are some shots that just have to be... Um, that just have to be done. Um, and while you're working, you sometimes have to put personal development on hold and you have to um, just get your work done and not much time for exploring your artistic side. Um, uh, which is the situation with the work permits? Um, well, I'm not a super great expert on this, but I hear that um, currently at Canada, it's very, very tricky. It, it takes a long time for a, a, a um, visa to go through. So if you plan to do something in Canada, you should plan for that early. And in America, they uh, like the big studios like Disney or Pixar, um, sometimes help their animators to get the visas. But, you know, even they, they, they sometimes cannot do everything. Um, all right. So uh, one thing that I have to make absolutely clear, there is no shame in stepping back a phase. If you worked for a while and you realize there's still so much that I don't, don't know. Uh, there are actually, I know many people who went back uh, um, to learn on their own or even go to animation mentor. I know of one animator, she, she worked at big on big feature films and afterwards was like, no, I want to have some more input of professionals. And she took an animation mentor class. Um, yeah, just keep going, developing yourself in all directions. And also there are sometimes, um, artists, independent animators, they want to go back to the, to the first phase to just play in experimentation. They just want to do what they want to do. They don't want to do that commercial stuff. They want to explore artistic worlds. And for some of them, it works really well. Um, also, it's never too late to start learning animation. And it's also never too early. Um, uh, I know a couple of animators who started learning in the 30s and 40s, and now they make awesome films. Um, yeah, that, that's also a thing that I think doesn't exist in all um, in all industries, which I think is pretty wonderful. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit a little bit about the demo reel. This something this is something that we could talk like we could do an entire webinar about. Um, but let's just go over some points. Um, generally, demo reels are one to three minutes long. Um, I wouldn't never ever make them any longer than that. Those people watching demo reels, they don't have much time. And they have like, if you really, if you are uh, applying for big studio, they, 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 they have hundreds of demo reels to watch through. Um, so only show your very, very, very best work. Um, also, don't overestimate yourself. Let other people judge what your best work is. Show your work to other people, like that, let them rank it, let, take the advice. 
Um, uh, if you apply for a professional job, um, don't include practice exercises like the bouncing ball or pendulum. Uh, you should be way past that if you apply as a full animator at a studio. You should have performance things, or if it's a more physical thing, you should have like a parkour thing or something like that. Um, unless it's for a trainee or internship pro program, then it's probably still okay to show these. Um, now, if you think about how the animation supervisors are watching this, you know, they have seen 20 demo reels already, and then they put your demo reel on, and you need to show them something very impressive in the end, uh, in the beginning first. So they're like, oh, wow, okay, that's interesting. Now you got their attention. And then at the end, you should also show a really, really great shot so that when your demo reel ends, they go like, wow, that, that last thing, that was really good. And oh yeah, and it's the, the, the end. Then, then they talk about you in a positive light. And that is what you want. Um, my recommendation is no music, except for the music that is there in the film scene. Um, the thing with music is that, you, you know, I, I think you all know that you shouldn't put anything debatable like dub, dubstep or uh, metal, um, but even like light music can be annoying uh, if you hear like 100 different reels. And even more, I think the problem is that the, the, the music that you just put over it um, destroys the rhythm that you made in an animation, right? If you make a demo reel, you maybe want to show a sad scene. You maybe want to show a fast action scene. You maybe, you know, you want to, you want to change speeds. You want to change rhythm. And if you then just put the same music over everything, you destroy that. You destroy your animation with that music. Um, so do, don't do that. Mm. If you just have test animations, you could put sound effects on them. You could put music on there that fits to the scene, you know, as if it was, as if it was a real film, as if it was part of a real film. Think about it. If you would see the reel of a Disney animator, you would only see snippets from Disney films. You know, that feels different than just copy pasting some music over everything. Um, yeah, there might be an exception to this if you talk to clients as a freelancer and you just want to blow them away, you just want to impress them with all the stuff that you did, then you can maybe make a reel um, with music that just shows all the cool things that your studio did, which actually was the demo reel that I showed earlier. It was more like a studio reel. But on the professional field, to get hired by an animation supervisor, uh, no music. Um, oh yeah, uh, thank you, Jenna. She added that um, the animation supervisors also often mute music. When music starts, they just go mute. And if you have an acting scene with sound, then that's too bad that your, uh, your demo reel is now on mute. Um, all right, you should make a demo reel exclusively for the current job application um, because usually a studio, if you're applying for a certain position, you need to uh, apply for what the studio is looking for. Like if you apply at a really cartoony studio, you might want to show them different stuff than when you want to apply at a VFX animation studio and they want really, really realistic stuff then you cannot just show them your cartoony things, you know, then they will doubt that you can animate a realistic dragon if you only have Looney Tunes stuff in there. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, demo reels with physical action in them. Physical action is not my strong point, but um, here's some things that I would look for um, in, a, in, a, in a physical shot. Like you want 
absolute clarity. You want all poses to read. You want the action to read. You want it to be just slow enough so that you can follow it, but just fast enough so that it, it feels fast and cool and action-y. Uh, be careful with camera moves. We had a demo reel critiquing a little while ago. Um, where we saw that the camera was really distracting and it makes people doubt if your animation quality is that good. Uh, yeah, you need to have an interesting rhythm. If you have action, you need to, you know, sometimes go slower and then it goes on really fast and then there's a break. You know, it needs to have this up and down, this flow that keeps things interesting. Um, and then of course, weight has to be just right in your demo reel demonstrating physical stuff. Um, maybe you want to show that you can do different styles, you know, even in realism, you can, you can make it a little more than real. Um, you can exaggerate a little and you need to show that, um, that ability, uh, for acting performances. Now that is the thing that I like that I'm looking for and that I was uh, that was my job to hire um, as an animation supervisor, people who can do acting performance as well. And what I look for is that the thinking and the nonverbal communication is right. And many animators do um, uh, the pauses wrong. They're either something sometimes too long or not there. But you need to keep in mind that, you know, there are processes in our head which take time and I want to see them. I want to see this thinking. I want to see that in their eyes. I want to see microfacial expressions going on. Um, um, yeah, those are the things that I would be looking for in acting performance. Uh, then realistic acting impulses. Now, if you would have a bad animation and a character is thinking about what to, what to eat, for example, and a bad animator or a beginner animator, they could animate it like this. They think, okay, the two things I need to show are thinking and I have the idea. And then we get a floaty mess like, like this. Um, but, you know, what it actually needs to be is that it's not happening at once. Like it's first, oh, I need something to eat, like indicate that hunger somehow that it's readable and I'm like ah, yesterday hmm, I had sushi and now hmm, I would like ah, pizza yeah pizza would be good pizza is good but you see how many steps I had in there like those steps need to be there uh, uh, thoughts go gradually and you need to have all these steps all these little grades shifting, all these thinking, all these thoughts leading somewhere, you need to be able to show that in a good acting performance. Okay, so now let's talk about some paths, paths that you could um, walk to master animation. One is obviously studying animation at a college. We talked earlier about that studying is not a requirement, but of course it helps because you are forced to do that systematic learning that you might not do on your own. Uh, you have access to a community of mentors and studios and you can, you can network with people. Um, I have to warn you though, and this is something that I, I don't hear often, um, but the, the more I see different universities, you know, I, I teach at different, different schools, the more I think this is true. There are two very different types of schools. And, uh, yeah, there's this, the more systematic approach to learning and the more project oriented approach to learning. And you will be unhappy <laughs> if the school doesn't match your type, doesn't match what you prefer. Um, the problem is the schools, they will always tell you they are both. Of course, they have classes and projects because, you know, that's the best thing, theory and, um, and practice. But in my experience, one side on any animation school is always stronger. I don't know where that comes from. Maybe that is a personal preference of the person running the school. I don't know. Um, but yeah, 
in the systematic one, you have systematic classes. You have schedules with different subjects. Like Monday is you learn about anatomy. Tuesday, you learn about colors. Uh, Thursday, you do animation exercises. You know what I mean? You have, you have a tight schedule that repeats. And then you have lessons that build up on the previous lessons. Like if you, in the first week, you did anatomy of the arm, in the next week, you do anatomy of the torso. Then in the week after, you do anatomy of the legs. This is a systematic school. Um, and then, of course, you also do exercises uh, according to that specific um, lesson that you just learned. Uh, in the project-oriented school, projects are the, the the main form of exercise. You're basically just thrown into the cold water and be like, yeah, make an animation film. Make, make whatever you want. Convince me, show me, and we help you if you have questions. Like this is <laughs> the approach of many project-oriented uh, 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 schools. They do have lessons. They do have... Um, um, they do have guest lecturers, they do have mentors that talk about stuff, but it's not as systematic uh, as, as it is on that other school. Um, and like at least the Film Academy at Baden-Württemberg where I studied, they reacted to our needs. Like if we said, you know, I wanna know more about this software or um, I wanna talk to a Disney animators, they, they tried to make that happen. They ma made a lot of stuff happen. Um, but it wasn't, you know, we didn't have those people over a longer period of time. You should figure out and know what you prefer. Uh, both sides have advantages and disadvantages. I wouldn't say that any one is better than the other. Um, actually, you know, the systematic approach is very effective on getting to a high looking skill level um, faster. Because you know you're you're being carried on the shoulders of smarter people who already figured this stuff out. Um, on the other hand, side, uh, if you work on projects, I think the things that you figured out yourself they stick better in your head, like and you really thoroughly understood them if you learned them through a project. So yeah, there there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, sometimes it might be quite good to force yourself to leave your comfort zone and, uh, you know, maybe have a face where you'll learn more systematically and then maybe have a face where you'll learn more project oriented. I think that would be the ideal, ideal thing to do. Um, how do you determine if an animation school is good? Uh, be careful with nice looking schools. <laughs> it's my experience because um, nice rooms and equipment are mainly <laughs> designed to impress parents. Uh, they don't say anything about how the students actually work and feel in that environment. You should ask alumni, not students. You can ask students too, but the advantage by asking alumni is they can tell you if, um, if they got a job, if they felt prepared by their university. Um, and they can only do that when they already started working. Uh, of course, ask them, would they do would they go again what did they like what did they dislike um uh, rebecca yeah this webinar is being taped and everybody who registered will get a replay link to it um uh and one thing that you should listen to if you ask an alumni about um uh, the school is how they use the equipment and the IT service. Um, the Film Academy, when I was uh, studying there, uh, it was nice, but it wasn't the nicest building, but we had an awesome IT and we had awesome equipment. Whenever we wanted something, we got it. When we wanted new software, um, we needed to tell them what it was for, but you know, they would really consider it and do it. And um, at other schools, they, might even have this stuff, but they don't have an, a capable IT to make this all work. You should really watch out for this. Just having a um, a good computer standing in the room doesn't mean that the students can use them, sadly. Um, research about the teachers. 
check their work that they did before. Maybe you even find online interviews and classes that they made. Uh, famous guests are always good, of course. You know, if, if someone like Glenn Keane or something is doing a guest lecture, amazing. Um, keep in mind, though, sometimes those really successful famous people, they are not the best teachers. Um, in my opinion, it's good to have a mix. Like maybe a person who has a very academic approach um, uh, uh, can can give you insights that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, or um, then, of course, the person who is working in the industry can give you uh, the 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 actual actionable advice of how to survive in the industry. Um, okay, let me let me drink a sip. Um, yeah, Rohit, Rohit, we will talk about in a little bit how you how you learn animation without an animation school. Uh, first, let's look over the cost of an animation school. Um, public universities cost like this. These are the prices in the U.S. around four thousand to eighteen thousand dollars per year. Uh, private school like CalArts costs thirty-seven thousand dollars a year, um, but you know, you if you want to save some money, you could look at other countries. Um, I don't know how it's now, but when I studied at the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg, I got amazing education for 200 euros per semester, um, which is, yeah, pretty amazing. Um, if you're willing to move, maybe looking at Europe uh, might be an interesting thing. Uh, you can, of course, also study animation at a non-animation uh, uh, school there's some colleges who offer animation programs who are not focused on that um, or you study something else first before you want to do animation generally every knowledge and skill will help you um, like especially in filmmaking you know any topic can can come back to you anything um, you can start animation at any age you can even if you studied something else don't be afraid um, and but if you really want to reach that pro level you need dedicated learning um and then you might want to enter a more systematic animation approach um yeah then there are online schools the advantage of this that the uh, is that the the people teaching there like they are usually top professionals which is pretty amazing um they give you like little mini project uh to do and they are systematic kind of because you know they have they have lectures and tasks but they are always limited to like this class topic they're never like go on for a couple of years they're always like maybe a month maybe several months um they have a digital community uh, what's good is that they have a community but you know a digital community is different from a real community from being around real um uh, real people i don't know you need to know what kind of person you are if you if you use that opportunity to digitally communicate with other people um i would recommend um uh online schools for people who are more systematic learners or who decided that a systematic phase would be good for them. Because um, while it is project oriented uh, a little bit, it can feel a little dry to do those exercises one by one to work your way through the exercises. Um, the cost for an uh, animation school, and here I only picked out uh, animation mentor cost $2,499 per course. So if you do the entire character animation course from A to Z, it's $14,000, uh, which is much cheaper um, than a actual school like CalArts. Self-learning or teaching. Um, I think personally that is very, very hard to do. You need to have a lot of discipline and a strict plan to um to do that to actually get yourself on a track that you're getting better and better and better mm. and what you most of all probably need to develop develop is brutal honesty to judge if your book uh, if your work is good enough and what's not working and 
then figure out how to make it work, even if it hurts to throw your animation away. Uh, this is sometimes very hard to do if you don't have a teacher who's like, you should do this over again. Um, as a self-learning person, you should seek input from other peers, from other people in the same situation. Uh, you should maybe consider mentoring, finding a mentor, or at least occasionally, which is what we'll talk about next. Um, the cost of self-teaching, I think you need like I, I really roughly estimated this. Let's say you need about 10 books per year. I average the cost for $30. You know, some books cost $50, some cost 10. Um, yes, Saif, I will try to help you guys in the end of this webinar a little bit with, with advice on what steps um, you can do as a self learner. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is kind of part of it. Like get books, get 10 books per year minimum, get a membership at a tutorial website, like Plural Site, uh, for example, that costs roughly around $300 per year, depending on where you, where you do it. If you learn Blender, you could go to, to Blend Cookie, Blender Cookie, or something like this. Um, the advantage of a membership site is that it opens up a whole variety of courses and you can, you know, go a little bit in different directions, explore different directions, uh, which might be better than getting a precise course for a topic that interests you. Sometimes it's good to wander around a little. Um, and yeah, you should still spend around like $500 in video tutorials. Like if for any topic that interests you, you need that professional input as a, self learner like um it still costs money it still should cost money um and so we have like around a thousand one hundred dollars um per year uh, then another way to do it i already mentioned it is mentoring and personally this is my my favorite because of the personal connection between the mentor and the student uh the mentor can make lessons and uh, exercises tailored to your strengths and weaknesses. Um, they can mix theory and practice for you as it's needed. Um, and they do that personalized. They do that for you. They listen to your situation, to your problems, and they try to come up with the plan for you that makes you better. Uh, in, in my eyes, Oh yeah, CG Cookie. That was the the name of the website I was looking for earlier. Sorry, but yeah, mentoring in my eyes the most effective way. Um, the cost for private mentoring uh, varies between sixty dollars to one hundred and twenty dollars per hour. So, but even if we take the one hundred and twenty dollar price and we say uh, you have a mentoring session every week then that would still land around $6,240, uh, which is less than both uh, Animation Mentor and the actual school. Um, problem is you just have to find a good mentor or somebody willing to teach you. Uh, okay, let's talk about software a little bit. First of all, relax all these debates around what is the best software that you should use. Um, I think the software doesn't matter as much as many people think um, because the principles, your skills, your actual animation skills, you should be able to bring them out in any software. You just have to relearn maybe where the buttons are, but uh, the principles of how things work are the same in every software. Um, that is just the truth. Uh, it can't hurt, of course, to learn the standard software for 3D. That is Maya. Uh, it's used at DreamWorks, I think, too, but definitely at Disney currently um, and at many other advertisement production companies and so on. For 2D Vector uh, at the moment, uh, still Flash, still Adobe Flash. Studios are even using outdated version of the program uh, because they have their entire pipeline and uh, entire workflow built on it. Uh, Toon Boom Harmony is a very important uh, uh, standard by now. Mm. Many Disney XD and Disney Channel um, series are made with that. Uh, personally, I would keep an eye on Boho. I think with the latest release, they added some nice stuff that might uh, 
give them the ticket to be in more and more studios. Uh, 2D bitmap software is TV Paint. Um, now TV Paint is known for simulating brush-like uh, uh, textures really well, and vector stuff is more like clean outlines. Um, and also in Harmony, you can make rigged characters. You can animate frame by frame, but you can also work with 2D rigs. Uh, you should always keep out your eyes open. You should always keep your eyes open for innovation, though. Um, I know that when I started um, Toon Boom Harmony, uh, not many studios were using it. So uh, I had a really good time where I was the go-to professional teaching other people um, teaching other people harmony and also it's very interesting what's happening for example i've been using for for the inner world 2 now we've been working with spine uh, which is a, a animation software specifically for games specifically for unity and in this niche i think it's unbeatable like the interface is different from any other animation software but you can basically learn the software just by looking at the interface a uh, really impressive thing and the programmer really look that uh, really um, takes your input and your bug reports into a account. And if you report a bug, like they fix it the next day, it's so amazing. Um, and of course you can help those new software packages to become bigger and better. And I think this is a great chance. Um, oh, Philippe, we will talk about uh, animation programs, free animation programs in a second. First of all, let's go through the budget for the expensive stuff. Uh, the Creative Suit Suite um, costs $599 per year. It includes Flash, which now is named Animate, uh, Adobe Premiere, which is the video editing software, Photoshop, which you probably know, and After Effects, which can be used for compositing and motion design. I think for that price, that is an amazing offer. <laughs> Uh, and it is an industry standard also, and you get your video editing software, which is also very important if you make an entire film. Um, the student price is like half of this, I think, $250. Um, definitely worth a look. Toon Boom Harmony is a little more expensive, 180 euros for the essential version. There is a very cheap student version too, like $10 or so. Um, but 876 for the version that has like all the cool rigging features. Uh, Maya, really expensive, 1,470 euros. Um, there is a free student version though. If you are enrolled anywhere at any university, you can use your university emails to get Maya for free for three um, years, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, you might want to invest in a drawing tablet or screen, especially if you're in 2D animation. Uh, a cheap one, cheap off-brand one costs $30, and a big screen, a Cintiq to draw on is um, about almost $2,000. Um, and a lower, lower high-end workstation will cost around $1,200. Now, this might scare you off a little bit now, but um, you can actually start, you, you are watching this on a computer, right? And the computer that you have, you can already use for doing animation. And there's free software that you can use without spending a cent. Um, so for 2D map, there is um, Krita and 2D Pencil. Krita is actually not that big yet. They don't have many animation tools. I think you don't, you can't import sound currently, which means you cannot really use it for making really big stuff. But for starting, for doing the bouncing ball exercises or the first body mechanic stuff with jumping and walk cycle, you can do that in Krita, no problem. It's a Photoshop clone for digital painting. Uh, pen, 2D Pencil, I think the name is Pencil 2D. Um, I misspelled that, Pencil 2D, um, is an animation software that I think was also used in some professional productions. Um, then there's some vector software, Synthic, and OpenTunes. OpenTunes is actually based on the software Tunes, which is used at Studio Ghibli. Uh, so it is a very, it reminded me a lot of Harmony. Um, like the workflow is a little bit difficult to learn, but a very po powerful software. 
uh, that you need to to you need the, the learning curve curve is pretty steep um but yeah you you have the software uh, at your fingertips then um there's a storyboarding software called storyboarder uh, if you google that uh, it's a very simple storyboarding thing but it's it's totally enough it's just what you need if you want to do storyboards uh, for 3D, of course, the evergreen go-to recommendation is Blender, which is an open source 3D software, doesn't cost a cent, and is really, really powerful, has a lot of the features of the of Maya, for example. Mm. Yeah, as I said, free for students uh, is Maya. Don't pass this opportunity, don't let this opportunity go past. I think all Autodesk products are in fact free for students. Um, they have pretty amazing stuff. Uh, okay, let's go over the methods of learning real quick. And this is maybe also something that those people who want to self-learn really want to put to use. Um, one thing that you can do is the analysis of great work. Uh, and I actually don't see many people do that. It's, it's not that difficult. You just grab your favorite movie, you put it on your computer, you um, export your final, your, your favorite scene, and you look through it frame by frame. And maybe you annotate over it. You try, you really, re the thing is, you really have to look for stuff. It's not enough to just, to just watch it and be like, oh, that's nice. No, you want to recreate this. You have to know how it's done, why it's done, why it works the way it works. Um, one great way to do that is with a website called SyncSketch.com where you can upload a video and then you can go through it frame by frame, you can draw over it, you can even do that in sync with other people at the same time. Uh, I did that actually to uh, look at a couple of scenes on our YouTube channel, Animator Island TV, um, where we, for example, we looked at Moana's You're Welcome uh, that was the software that I was using to draw over the image. Um, and you can do the same thing for reference, that you either film yourself or you, um, like there are, there are reference libraries of people walking or maybe a fight choreography and really annotate and try to find the important, uh, the important findings, the things that define this animation, the contact poses, where the breakdowns are, how the arcs go, you need to draw, draw that in. How else are you supposed to see it? It's going by so fast. Um, then the thing that you have to do also, and that many people skip, is read as much theory as you can read. Um, not only animation theory, but also about art in general, about storytelling, about acting. All of this, you know, we saw it in the beginning, Animation is a very, very big field. All of this will help you to become a better animator. Uh, and then, of course, practice. Exercise just for the sake of practice. The thing is, it also takes the pressure out. If you say this is a practice exercise, then it's okay if you fail. If you didn't make it, if you didn't reach your goal, analyze why you didn't reach your goal, why does it still look wrong, and then try again. That's the cool thing about practice. It doesn't matter. It's not like you lose something commercially. Um, and then there's side effect practice. When you do a real project, you will of course always learn. Uh, maybe even to the point where you're like, hmm, I've never done this before. I need to research how this is done, how other animators did it, how it's done in reference, all this kind of stuff. Um, the thing about these, um, these modes is um, alternate them. Like, do a little bit of analysis, do a little bit of reading, do a little bit of exercises. And here we have the last thing, um, learning software. Uh, of course, sometimes you just need to sit down and systematically learn a software. That's, that's just how it is. Uh, but never ever confuse that with learning animation. For example, if you would be learning painting, you could learn about the materials, about the brushes, you could learn how to hold them, you could learn about the color attributes, um, but that doesn't make you a good painter, you know, to just know about the tools. Those are two separate things. And it's important to have good tools, but, you know, a good painter could all, probably also paint with cheap acrylic color and still do an amazing picture. Um, of course, it helps to have good equipment, but, you know, it doesn't define your work. It doesn't define your art. 
Um, yeah, okay, so in a little bit, we will talk about how to start serious self-learning step by step. We have some book tips, we have some tips for exercises. Um, uh, later, we'll talk about some mistakes to avoid. But before, I want to use the opportunity to make you aware of some special offer that we are having right now. Um, we talked about mentoring a little bit earlier. And the thing is, um, I'm trying something new on Animator Island. Um, you can actually get mentoring with me now. And um, of course, I already told you, I think this is the most effective way to learn. Together, we could identify your strengths and weaknesses. Um, we could get you where you want to be. Um, by going through your work, I'll give you feedback. I'll give you a chance to improve and polish your work. Uh, so you really have that impressive shot for your demo reel that will maybe open uh, the doors at studios for you. Uh, currently mentoring on the website cost 89 euros, but um, this weekend only, if you buy mentoring, it will be 10 euros off. So it's 79 euros. Um, I actually prepared a little thing for you to click on. Um, okay. I put it on the screen now so you can click on there. You can keep the page open in the background to um, to later do the purchase if you want, if you want to schedule mentoring with me. Um, but there is even more, and this is completely unannounced. You are the first person to hear about this. Uh, in February, we are doing a workshop, a get shot done workshop. Um, the goal is that you can start 2018 with your best animation yet. And um, um, maybe there's an animation that you always wanted to do, or maybe, you know, you still need an amazing shot for your demo reel, then I think 2018 is the year where you should start doing that. And if you want help with that, you could use this workshop that we're offering. Let's create something awesome together. In one month in February, uh, you get the chance to meet with a group of peers and me to do the professional guidance. Um, this workshop includes two classes, two lessons on different days. One is about how to develop the best possible concept for your animation shot. And the other class is about how to create the best possible animation, advice and tips and tricks for that. Um, there will be two group critiquing sessions where we all share our current state, our current ideas, and think about how we can improve it together. The bundle includes, the workshop includes actually, actually two personal mentoring sessions with me where we can go into the really fine details. And yeah, it's all included in that one price. It's starting on February 3rd. Uh, I made sure that all the appointments are uh, on the weekend for the people who have to work. Um, but we can also schedule the mentoring sessions we can schedule in the week. There are only 15 spots available. Well, actually, today, the person who referred the, my, the most people to this webinar will, one, will win one of these spots. So it's only 14 spots left. Um, it's usually priced 400 euros, uh, but this weekend only it's 299 euros. Yeah, and the course is, um, dollars is a little bit more, like it's always like $10, $10 more on the price, but um, yeah, it's about the same. Um, okay, so to uh, summarize, personal mentoring, this weekend is $10 off and the Get Shot Done workshop is $100 off. And I'm very excited because we have never done something like this before. I'm, I really wanna get to know you and your abilities and I wanna push you so that you can make the most amazing animation in this group with me. Um, so I would be very happy if, um, if a couple of you would show up there. Um, so, 
If that is interesting to you, you should click on that link because I will take it away in a second um, so we can talk about more animation stuff. All right. So as promised, we will talk a little more about a step-by-step -step approach to self-learning. Um, and I think the most important thing to start with in any phase where you want to, to, to learn for yourself or where you really want to get down to, um, to learn is to identify your situation and your weaknesses first. Um, because then you can act on them. You can get the specific help that you need. And a mentor could help you with that process, but um, you can also um, do that for yourself, audit yourself, have a look at your work very closely, maybe ask other people what they think you are missing. Um, if you have that down, you should seek theory input for that. Um, some great books. I know this is a classic, like everybody recommends the animator survival kit. Um, it's especially great because it's very, um, template-y about, about the approach to teaching. Like you can see how, um, how he animates walk cycles and then you can, um, and then you can copy that and you can animate the walk cycle, how it is described in the book. Um, then another great book that opened my eyes in regards to, to um, acting is Acting for Animators by Ed Hooks. Um, having this theory input can really make a difference if you're lacking in these areas. Um, I know, of course, there are websites like animatorisland.com. As I said, we have been writing articles since five, six years. We have one on pretty much every topic. So if you realize that you want to make your poses stronger, search posing on animatorisland.com and you will probably find something. Um, then also you might find out that your weakness is in a software area, like that everybody's looking for Maya animators, but you are not a Maya animator. You only know 3ds Max or Cinema 4D. Then you should take a week to learn um, that new software. And in most cases, even the manufacturer, even the, the maker uh, uh, of the software, they offer tutorials how you can master their software. Then there are always uh, platforms like Udemy where you can buy specific tutorials. Like I just recently did for Moho. I wanted to learn Moho. So I got a Udemy course. Um, Okay, Greg, bye. <laughs> uh, there will be a replay. So if anybody uh, has to leave now, uh, don't worry. I'll send out a replay link later. Um, okay, now we get to the really important step, though. It's um, the exercises. You have to do the exercises. From the books, for example, you know, if um, um, in the case of the Animator Survival Kit, just do a run cycle, do a walk cycle, try to do those amazing things that are outlined and served on a silver platter to you. Um, and of course, on Animator Island, we have the 51 animation exercises that give you some ideas of what you could practice. Ideally, you should design your own exercises because you know you identified your weaknesses and now you throw yourself into the cold water practice what you think you're lacking and get feedback if you can from professionals or at least from peers and try to learn from it try, try to make it better uh next time my advice would be to write down to to like you know you need to save that somewhere those findings um because a human head can only can only uh hold so much sometimes when i read um, old Animator Island articles or watch old Animator Island videos. I'm like, how did I know that? That's that's amazing. How could I forget this? Like you think that you don't forget, but you will. Um, so yeah, record these findings, do the practices. And then like, th th this is the thing that also most people don't do. Make a specific plan idly for every single small step, as small as possible. For example, 
start learning the the anatomy of arms on a specific date and put that in your calendars. Take no other appointments on this date. Do it on this day. Uh, same for one of the 51 animation exercises. Plan to animate the bouncing ball next Friday. Really do it. Um, and then of course you can make, if it's a big thing, you can make little milestones, like learn how to do modeling in, or, uh, or learn how to model a face in Maya by next week. And then you make the plan, learn how to model a torso, learn how to, and so on. And you put those little steps on your calendar. And this will help you to keep going. This will help also help you to see the process, which I think is very motivating. If you look in your calendar and you see, oh, I've already done all these things. I've already learned all these things. That is something that feels very rewarding. Um, yeah, and the same if you do an acting shot for your demo reel, which is kind of what we'll be doing in the Get Shot Done workshop. We try to get the animatic done to a certain date. We try to do the blocking by a certain date, the splining, and so on. Um, small faces, small steps, very important. Um, and then, of course, always look for a community. Um, people that give you feedback. Um, Deviant Art and New Grounds are like very classic artist communities. Um, then what I recently discovered, there are Facebook groups for everything, like for softwares, for the animation fields, for storyboard artists, you know, everybody seems to have a Facebook group. And if it doesn't exist, you can open one. Um, and which is pretty cool because you can just, you know, if you have a question for a software, you just throw that into that group and somebody answers uh, if you're lucky. Um, this was really my discovery of 2017, those groups on Facebook. Uh, soon on Animator Island, we actually, around those workshops, we will also uh, create a small community, a, a forum where people who purchase the, um, the workshop can communicate among each other and with me and JK. Um, all right, so. Now, another goodie at the end, real quick, let's go through 11 mistakes um, that I think you should avoid. One is ignoring the other jobs around animation. When I started animation, I was very set on, I want to become a Disney animator. But then I realized that independent animation was so much more fun for me. And, you know, at Disney, I would be just a small little part of the whole, which I think can be can be amazing too and, 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 and really rewarding to work, work on such a big film together. But, you know, I like to control more of the production, to maybe even sometimes do story, to sometimes only do, do animation and sometimes do production. And because I'm like just a small independent artist, I can jump around in these fields. Or you might realize, hey, modeling or texturing is actually more fun to me. Like this is sometimes something I could do every day. There's no shame in switching your path and trying out different things and then adjusting your path. Um, what you should avoid is one-sided learning. We talked about it. You shouldn't only learn from practice. You shouldn't only learn from doing pro uh, projects. Um, you shouldn't only learn from theory. You should have a healthy mix. Then uh, a very big mistake is picking the wrong school. Um, oh, this is something actually that you realize when you ask the alumni and they are like, oh, the school, we, we never had real class. All we had is projects. That was somebody who went to the wrong school um, who should have gone to a systematic school. And uh, sometimes if you ask someone from a systematic school, they will tell you like, oh, we never really could make any projects. We haven't, don't have any real experience. You know, these are the two extremes. Um, make your life easier by picking the right school for you or at least being aware that you might be have consciously picked the other one. Um, what you should also never do is blaming conditions and equipment or waiting because of conditions or equipment. Um, you know, it might be nice to work on a Cintiq, a uh, big screen draw on a big screen, or it might be nice to have Toon Boom Harmony, but as we saw earlier, you can get open tunes and it's almost exactly as powerful. Um, the computer you already have is probably fine for most uh, uh, um, for most 3D stuff. 
uh, and exercises you can definitely do, you know, the first exercises you can definitely do on cheaper equipment with cheaper software. Um, there's just no excuse. <laughs> um, then number five, mistake number five can be a lack of discipline. Uh, sometimes you just need to learn to go through with what you planned to pull yourself together, to realize, no, you're not in fun land. You're, you're doing this as a work, as a profession. You need to, to, to sometimes, you know, just go through a valley to come, to come back up again. Um, that being said, sometimes some projects should be abandoned. If you're like completely in a corner and you com feel completely unhappy, then it's sometimes better to stop. Like you shouldn't burn yourself up, but, um, yeah, uh, sometimes forcing yourself to do the work can be a big part of your animation career and can actually help you to, to get the rewarding result in the end. Um, you also, though, shouldn't be number six, mistake number six, you shouldn't be too hard on yourself. Um, animation, in my mind, is not worth burning out over. Like, um, it's not like you, um, it's not like you need to keep going. It's not like life depends on that you do animation. Um, I mean, I would always like, if somebody would tell me, well, but animation doesn't matter. It's something that the world doesn't need. I would also counter that, you know, a lot of people spent their hard earned money the hard earned money that they earned from standing in a factory uh, uh, five days a week, they spent that on animated films and on games. So there must be some, some value to it. Um, but I still think, you know, you should not, um, you should not burn over that. Um, yeah, that's mistake number six. Mistake number seven, bad self-awareness. Um, I said a couple of times that you need to judge yourself honestly, uh, to recognize your strengths and your weaknesses, both. And you need to develop that awareness because that is what helps you to get better. If you know what your weaknesses are, you can fix them. If you, if you know what your strengths are, you can advertise yourself correctly. And that helps you getting better jobs. You know, if, if you can say to somebody, this is my strength, and then I hire you and then you do an amazing job on that. Um, you need that realistic image of yourself. Um, number eight, not asking for help. Again, community, we were talking about this several times. Ask for help, get help from peers and pros. Um, number nine, don't just copy other people's styles. It's important to study other people's styles, especially as a 2D animator, you need to be able to replicate other people's styles, but you should also find your own voice and find the your own stuff that you like the most, uh, that you like to do the most. Uh, number 10, something that you shouldn't do, especially as a freelancer, is selling yourself short. Uh, and a good measurement to see if you're selling yourself short is to see what do I need for, for survival, for living. Research living costs, research rent, maybe not only for your current situation if you're studying, but also projecting like, you know, if I have a baby, if I have a family, how much does that cost? How much does rent in a bigger apartment cost? Because I want a bigger apartment sooner or later. I want a car. You need to consider all of that when you tell a client how much money you cost or when you tell um, how much um how much you want to get paid, you need to know that. And you need to know why you can't go under that. Um, also take in, in into account health insurance and the days that you will not be working and the days that you need to learn more. Um, take all that into account. Um, number 11, there are a couple of bad habits that you might learn. Mm that you have to unlearn or some beginner mistakes that you need to get rid of as fast as possible. In my opinion, a lot of beginners show a rushed timing. Um, make sure that all steps, we were talking about thinking steps earlier, have enough time. Um, and 
a little bit connected with us is floating motion. That is the other extreme. If the people don't dedicate to, to steps, then it just all floats around. Um, I think it can't hurt to master pose to pose animation first, which means that you hold a pose and then change comes and then a change comes again. And you know, you go very step by step, but I think you need to master that first before you try this keep alive that, that makes it a little more realistic. Um, but to my mind, um, pose to pose looks less wrong than um, beginner animation that tries to do keep alive and that tries to do all these fluent floating stuff. Um, let acting impulses be the guide for everything. Your character, his head, what he's thinking, what he's feeling, that needs to guide the um, animation on all the steps that he's going through and all the thoughts that he's going through. Um, yeah, and then apparently I have an extra bonus mistake or I can't count. Anyway, uh, a thing that will, by the way, I think who, who asked it, Rebecca, how you speed up your work. You need to turn your experience into workflow templates that will help you to, um, to get your work done faster. Uh, for example, I have like a, a pattern in my head when I have to animate fast, those are the um, steps that I try to hit, even if I don't have enough time. If I don't have time for in-betweens, I try to at least do these. I try to make an anticipation and ease out to show, you know, that, that, that the motion is speeding up, the breakdown in the middle, the ease in for some body parts, other body parts overshoot and overlap while the other parts already came to a stop. Um, if you have patterns like this in your head, you can animate faster because you do you do your pattern and then you already have a different, decent animation and then you can go refining from there. I know this is a little bit rushed. Uh, we might have more content about this um, one day. And then of course there's always mentoring. Um, all right. So I would slowly transition now to the Q and A. So if you have any more questions that you would like me to talk about, now is the time to post them. I think we already have some backed up um, that we can talk about. Uh, I just wanna mention the offer again. Uh, Jenna, can you show that on the screen? Or is it show still there? Oh, it's still there. The offer is still showing apparently. Um, yeah, click on that if you want to have $10 off or if you want to take part in the Get Shot Done workshop for $100 off. Um, the, these prices are only valid for the weekend. So yeah, and I, I would be so happy to see to see some guys there. Um, or, girls. or girls, yeah, of course. Um, and it actually might help us to go advertisement free on Animator Island, uh, which I think would be would be really cool. Um, now, uh, we already have some questions from the survey earlier, uh, that I sent out before the webinar. Somebody asked how much math is actually involved in animation. And I think the answer is as much as you would like. There are some animators who are very interested in the real physics and the real math, and they might work with actual, uh, formulas to, to really calculate their animation. It can't hurt to know them. It can't hurt for learning purposes to look at the real physical uh, uh, equations from time to time, just to see how it's really done. But they're also the opposite side of the spectrum, people who never concern themselves. Bye, Rebecca, thank you for, for being here. Um, but they're also people who never concern themselves about, um, um, about the math behind things and they do it all by feelings. And they're also great animators. Um, some tips on timing. I think timing really comes down to um, some of the stuff I said before. Like if you realize that timing is your problem, go a little more pose to posey, uh, try it like that first. Um, then 
try to get the poses right first. Like try separating the process of finding the poses and finding the timing. Find good poses first and then distribute them on the timeline and try different, different timings and just shift them around. Just make it a habit to shift them around and try and see if it works. Um, and yeah, I think that's all that I can think about it for now real quick. Now, what is the main thing in animation that animation schools look for in a portfolio? We talked about what, what companies look for in a portfolio. What do schools look for in a portfolio? Um, it depends on the school. Um, most of them have a little bit of an artsy expectation. Um, like they want to see that you are developing your own style and your own ideas. Um, and so, so they want to see hints of that. They want to see that you are a team player. If it's a, a project oriented, um, um, school, they want to see what you can bring to the project teams. Um, yeah, and just overall thinking about a little bit what your place can, could be in the animation industry and, and, and be a little wild with your goals. You know, you're at the beginning, you can still shape your career, but it can help to have a goal. And I think teachers really like to see that you're determined to make this path happen. Um, um, what story is a great story for a game or a movie? And how can I get it made? Maybe we should put this uh, question back because it's a very, very big question and look at some of uh, the ones in the chat. Um, Jenna, can you push some, a question to the screen? Which one? Any, I, I don't see them. Oh, you don't see them? Um, um, I broadcast it. So. Okay. Um, Julia is trying to decide between 2D and 3D animation course at college. Any advice on choosing between these? Who? Um, I think we also had a question earlier about the job chances for 2D and 3D animation. And yeah, you probably noticed that 2D is on its way out when it comes to feature animation. Uh, every feature at the moment is 3D or most features. There are some some great stuff like from Cartoon Saloon. Uh, there are some great 2D movies, but from Disney and Pixar at the moment, uh, feature animation is all 3D. Um, well, there is no no definite right or wrong. Uh, if you like the 3D films and you would like to be part of the 3D films, then it might help, you know, to to go in right there with 3D. Um, the thing about 2D is though, I think it's a very direct way of animating, a very flowy way of animating. The problem, in air quotes, problem that you have with 3D is that you have a puppet, you know, a, a rig. A rig is stiff and you need to fight a lot against this stiffness. And it doesn't have the spontaneity, spont uh, spontaneous energy of a drawing. You know, if you draw a pose, you can make it really flow. You can really feel the action while you draw. To me, this is an amazing experience uh, that I can just recommend to anyone. Um, yeah. And of course, um, with, with 2D, you can make very quickly some very cheap animation stories. Like if storytelling is your game, then, then 2D is certainly the faster way to make your first films. Um, yeah, those are some, some things you should consider. Um, I'll think about maybe I, 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 something else comes to my mind. Let's go to the, to the next question. Ray Becker asked, how do you keep your motivation in working on improving your skills within a long-term environment of no entry level job openings for someone who does 3D and not 2D? Um, so you currently, you don't find any job openings, but you still try to be motivated. Do I understand that right? Oh, Rebecca left, right? <laughs> 
Um, well, first of all, about motivation, I think what I said earlier about the scheduling, like, I think that can help you to stay on track and stay motivated because, you know, that's something, even if you feel down and you don't know what to do, you can look at your schedule and you have a direction again. Um, I like to, if plans go wrong, I like to make new plans. Um, you know, it, it, it takes you from not having anything to cling on to, okay, let's do a new plan and let's try this. And if that doesn't work, I make a new plan. But, you know, I like always having something to hang on to. Um, yeah, motivation wise, um, I, I think we made a video about motivation. You should really check that out on the YouTube channel. Um, one thing, I, I don't know if that's motivating, but I, one thing I think that is comforting to know is that in the end, I think quality will win. If you do high quality animation, and if you can show that in your demo reel, if you can show that in your passion projects, in whatever you put out in the internet, then the chances are good that somebody will find you and somebody will say, hey, I want this person to make an animation for me. You just need to put yourself out there and to have a little bit of luck. But um, in my experience, in the end, quality comes comes out. Quality gets rewarded. Um, okay, let's jump to the next question. And I have to drink something. Ricardo asks, is it okay to stick to a certain style of drawing in animation as a safety net, a home place, not permanently, just in general? Um, do you mean anime style? Uh, I think, y yeah, I mean, for the beginning, it can help you to practice what you need to practice in this style that you feel more comfortable with. It's maybe also a thing with motivation, you know, if you're practicing and on top of that, you have to force yourself to do it in a different style, that can be very tiresome. Uh, I just think you should have control of that. You should make the conscious decision to keep that style and also don't lose sight of that you need to animate in other styles potentially as well. Uh, okay, so next question. Uh, I think we had that one earlier when I was talking about, you know, okay. have this workflow template and that will help you, help you to speed up uh, a lot, like a routine that you can stick to. Kevin asked, would you recommend drawing animation on paper to start or does it matter if you start digital? Uh, okay, I have a confession to make. I have never really animated on paper. Um, I do kind of regret that because, you know, I've started, I've started little bits. I've done, done thumb, no, what are they called? Thumb key and flip books. I've done flip books. The thing is, I was talking about the flow earlier and there's just, this feeling is the strongest when you have when you work with an actual pencil and actual paper um, then you can really make stuff flow out of your pencil and really connect with the lines <laughs> um so i think that's a very good experience um so definitely do some practices on paper obviously nowadays many people start with digital the advantage of digital is that you can immediately test your animation you can immediately play it see if you are on the right track I would never, ever m miss that, want to miss that for anything in the world. It's just so much better uh, or faster to see your result immediately. Um, some some animation teacher, they complain about the students to do doing too much onion skinning on um, digital. Uh, what you might want to try when you do um, digital to simulate the paper feeling, the life of paper a little bit, is to, instead of flip, putting onion skin on, flip back and forth between the uh, the drawings. And, um, you know, because onion skinning 
um, like if you have one drawing here and one drawing here, um, tends to make you draw exactly in the middle, like you're just filling in gaps, you're just painting by numbers. But if you flip back and forth, you're actually thinking about the motion, about the, the you know, how to, how to continue the motion and how to let it flow more than putting a line exactly in the middle. Does that make sense? So sometimes it makes sense to, to combine these, these two worlds together and definitely do an exercise on paper if you have the chance. Yeah. What are the current trends in animation? What is wanted or needed the most as far as type of work and positions? Um, I have to confess the last information, last input I have on this was from this, this year's FMX, which was uh, in, um, uh, in April or May, something like that. Um, and currently back then they were looking for VFX artists and storyboard artists like crazy. Something that comes back regularly is texture artists, like people who really have fun, who really dive into texturing and UV mapping and not just see it as a necessary evil to deal with. Um, there's a lot around uh, uh, 3D animation. Um, uh, Animation itself is actually not always that high in demand. Um, it's a little harder to get into. You could also sneak into animation by doing something else first. Um, I know a couple of people who, who, who dived into rigging because, you know, it's kind of animation. And then they came back to animation. Um, yeah, trend, obviously, uh, 3D. 2D is used a lot uh, in... in um, Maybe this can go also as part of the answer to the other question. 2D is used a lot, though, in television. We actually have a comeback for 2D in television. I mean, we have great series on the air right now. We have the DuckTales reboot. Uh, a little while ago, we had um, Gravity Falls and, of course, Steven Universe. Um, those are 2D series that need 2D experts. Um, yeah, just... Um, also use the chance to go to such events and meet up with recruiters and producers and feel a little bit when you're ready to dive into animation, um, what it is that could be good for you. Um, all right. What else? Do we still have questions left? Yeah, do you want to do them all? Or... We can do a little longer. I'm not mad if anyone leaves. I know it's already getting late. <laughs> I think we can we can make the hour full if we have enough questions. Yeah. Mm. Any websites to find internships in animation studios? Um, I think Cartoon Brew actually didn't they start something like Cartoon Brew Jobs? I think they also have have internships on there. Um, what I would do is actually just ask the smaller studios in your area, like if you have a game studio there or an uh, independent animation studio uh, uh, within a reachable radius, just ask them. Uh, many studios are happy about interns because, as we said before, there's some work that some people don't want to do. Um, and interns don't cost as much as junior animators, so um, I, I don't think your chances are that bad to find to find interns. Um, yeah, good luck with that, Ram, Ram, Ramon. Oh, for 2D, is for 2D animation drawing required? Well, yeah, as a 2D, well, hmm. if you do frame by frame animation, you need to be pretty good at drawing. You need to be pretty good with volume and solid drawing, and you need to know anatomy and all this good stuff. There are 2D rigs, of course, which are more like 3D rigs. Um, and you animate those a little more like you do with 3D. Um, you, you, you set keyframes and the computer inter interpolates, and you just see that the computer is doing a good job, and you put in the overlaps and the, the, the eases and all this good stuff. Um, you don't necessarily have to draw for this, although if you're missing like a hand shape in your library, you, I don't know, it, it, it's probably good if you can, if you can draw that, 
a hand shape by yourself. Um, and besides, I, I think it can never hurt to uh, learn drawing because it forces you to learn how to look closer. You know, if you draw something, you really need to study it. You really need to learn it. And that can help you in a lot of ways uh, later on. Okay, next question. Is the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg only in German or does it have an English program too? Um, it's mostly in German. The German professors all speak German. If we have somebody from the US like it hooks or like, um, like some famous animator who have worked on Jurassic Park, we had some, some, yeah, Terrence Mason, that was the name. I was looking for the name. Uh, he of course makes his classes in English. There are a couple technical classes that are in English because the people working there, they, they come from America. Um, however, I saw a couple people at the film academy who started at the film academy, not speaking a word of German. And by the end of it, they were perfectly fluent in German. Um, so I don't know if this sounds like an adventure you would like to do, uh, you might, you have to learn the, the language, but, um, there also is a lot of stuff in, in English. Uh, just depends on how much you're willing to, to go on an adventure. Next question. Um, in our area and our country, there are no animation schools. I want to become a proportional animator or artist. So sir, please tell me what is the best way to learn 2D animation art step-by-step step and develop my skill. Um, as I said earlier, start with identifying what you lack. Make a plan for it. Um, incorporate as many different sources as possible, maybe even mentoring and stuff like that. And um, yeah, and then every now and then do another audit, like see what am I missing now? Uh, what could I do now? Um, certainly do, do anatomy and learn drawing if you want to be a 2D animator. Um, yeah, I hope that answered it to, uh, to your satisfaction. I know it's a lot of work and it's hard, but if you keep at, at it, if you go systematically from time to time, I'm sure you, you can, you can do it. All right. Do we have any more? So amazing. 34 people are still here. You guys are awesome. It's really cool. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, I saw this one earlier. Good question, Rohit. Is there any place in the internet where anybody judges my work and who can give feedback to my work? Yes, there is. And I actually, I forgot about it until you, um, you just wrote me. Whew, I don't know what it's called. I don't know if it still exists, but such a thing exists. So if any of you <laughs> feel like they want to make a Google search, I think Jenna might already be at it. Um, if not, I will add it to this chat later. So if you watch the replay later, I'll, I'll try to put it on the screen. Uh, I did that. I did a couple of critiques for random people. And I think you get awarded coins and stuff. It was really cool. Um, if that doesn't exist anymore, I think we should do it on Animator Island. Um, Pretty cool. Yeah, and I mean, the 11 second club is also something. Um, uh, the thing that I was talking about was about all shots in general. You could just put in any work. And then of course the 11 second club, you're totally right. Why didn't I mention the 11 second club before? That's also a very good place, which is obviously, it's around an 11 second snippet um, from like a random movie or TV series. Usually it's so obscure you don't know where it's from. And then you have to animate over that voice again, make it fit, uh, find a good, find a good idea that fits with that voice snip that was given to you. Yeah, 11 second club and the forums there are amazing. The people are super helpful uh, critiquing your work. Um, uh, like not just when you submit the, the animation, also look into the forum, into the work in pre progress forum. Um, all right. 
Uh, thank you, all you people, for your nice wor words. It's really flattering. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, yeah, if you want to support me and if you want to make this stuff happen more often, uh, maybe consider getting some mentoring. <laughs> Uh, we have a question. Uh, how can we become more cartoony, think more cartoony? Because I like cartoony animation and I want to focus on cartoony animation. So <laughs> what should I need to be more cartoony? Uh, look at the references. Look at good cartoony animation and find out what makes it so crazy. Especially, especially in cartoony animation, there are some gorgeous frames hidden in there. Like in the actions, they're like, smear fame frames where the character is completely distorted. You need to look at how the monsters did that. Um, it, it's, it's so amazing. Um, then I think in cartoony, you always need to find ways to push something. If something goes fast, try to, to hold it first and then make it even faster. If something goes slow, Try to make it even go slower. Play with the rhythm. Play with fast and slow and, and, and the impacts. Make the impact stronger. And you mostly can do that in the, in the, by making the spacing larger. You know, if something falls from here to here, then make the spacing not be like this, but make it more like here are some frames and then boom, it's here. Um, and you need to experiment with squash and stretch. How far can you push it until it breaks? How far can you, like, you want it to be feel still squashy and like a material, like an actual material, but you, you want to keep the volume. I think that is the point. Um, but you, you by, by stretching it, you need to keep the volume and you need to see how far you can take this. And, and you can actually sit down and practice that. Um, and see what other people say about it. Um, I think I saw, like there's this one animator on YouTube, Aaron, Aaron Long, um, he made a faster fish is his cartoon series. There's some really crazy movements in there. Uh, that's a good example for some contem contemporary stuff and something that is doable for an independent animator. All right, do. Yeah, next question. Uh, is it better to relocate to a new location with no job to network and try to get into the industry? Or is it better to just apply and hope that location isn't an issue? Whoo, that is a tough one too. Um, well, generally, if that is aligning with the face in your life that you say like, I want to start something new. I want to I want to see more of the world. I want to give another location a chance. Like if, if your mind is on that in general, I would recommend you to just, just do it. Just go to where the studios are that you like. Um, you know, if you don't find work in animation, there's always, there's always non-animation work that you can do to bridge some time. A lot of animators, actually, you can work as an illustrator or something, you know, or I did a, a, for a long time, I did a uh, web design. Um, like it's kind of creative, but you know, it, it's a little easier to find customers in that area. Um, so if you feel like you like to improvise, you would like to go on that adventure, I would say go for it. Um, and yeah. Uh, the other thing is also possible, of course. It just just apply first, play it a little safer, and 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 uh, only move when you actually have a job. Um, yeah, maybe make a list with pros and cons. Uh, there are even there are even apps for that. Um, I don't have the name again, of course, but they are like good systems where you award points for all the pros and cons that you listen listed and then you have a very mathematical way of determining um, what option is right for you. Um, all right. Samir, any idea what salary for 2D animator in Berlin? Oh, that highly depends. Uh, I was offered a position in Berlin once for a thousand, 2,100 euros contracted work uh, per month. And that is not so much. Uh, I had to turn that down. Um, 
I don't know, man. It depends. You, you, if, as, if you work as a freelancer, you certainly need to see that you can get more, more money around 3000 euros. I think you need per month to live. Uh, if you want to build up your life there, um, and I wouldn't work too long for anything in the direction of 2000 euros per month, because I don't know, you, you cannot save up stuff. You cannot build a cushion for you. Um, but it highly depends. It, it depends from studio to studio, from position to position, uh, and from your experience, of course. All right. Um, for a new freelancer, what are the important things necessary to get projects? Um, okay, <laughs> let me tell you something. The reason why you saw a demo reel from me earlier from 2015 is because customers have been coming to me ever since. I didn't need to make a new demo reel. Uh, once I had some things going, um, I was recommended to other companies. I got jobs again at a company where I worked uh, previously. Um, so the important things to necessary to get good projects, do good work. Uh, first, have a good pro portfolio where people say like, oh, this is interesting, this is unusual, this is what we need. Um, and then I think the people will keep coming. Uh, the jobs will keep coming. Uh, if you have a little bit of a low point, you could really invest into making like a landing page that is search engine optimized. You can you can offer explainer videos for companies. That is like a, a, a more safer thing than entertainment. Um, but yeah, above all, do get work, uh, do good work, and let people find that good work, and through this good work, find you. Uh, I think that is the point. Yeah. Okay, uh, guys, I am. Um, <laughs> I I think I can't go uh, on. Uh, my my mouth is so dry. I'm really tired now. It was amazing to talk to you guys. Uh, I'm so happy that so many showed up and about your wonderful, wonderful questions. Really interesting stuff. Um, I would really love to keep the conversation going. You uh, bet there will be more webinars like this. Um, Thank you, Rohit, for coming and for asking wonderful for questions. Um, so I'd be really happy if some of you decide to do the mentoring or even do the workshop. I think we can do some amazing stuff together. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all next time. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening, day, or whatever it is in your part of the world. And um, yeah, check back on animatorisland.com and on our Facebook. And uh, can't wait to see you again. Have a good night or day or whatever. Take care. Bye-bye.